Thank you, Operator. Hello, everyone. My name is Boana Flint, and I head up Polestar Investor Relations. Let me cover a few housekeeping points before handing over to Thomas Singenlatt, our CEO, for his opening remarks, followed by Johan Malkis, our CFO, who will comment on our quarterly financial results in more detail. This will take about 15 minutes, and we will then open the line for analyst questions. If we have some time left, we will take questions from the web, which I will read out. Before handing over call to Thomas, I would like to remind participants that many of our comments today will be considered forward-looking statements under the U.S. federal security laws and are subject to numerous risks and uncertainties that may cause Polestar's actual results to differ materially from what has been communicated. Forward-looking statements made today are effective only as of today, and Polestar undertakes no obligation to update any of its forward-looking statements. For a discussion on some of the factors that could cause our actual results to differ, Please review the risk factors section of our annual report on Form 20S or our other recent findings with the SEC. You may also find more information on our forward-looking statements in our findings with the SEC or on our investor presentation and recent press releases which are posted on our investor relation website. With that, I would like to turn the call over to Thomas. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Bojana. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our first quarterly results call. I will start with some opening remarks and then pass on to Johan to comment on our financial results and the 2022 outlook. Now, this is an amazing year for Polestar, full of major milestones. I'm particularly proud of the phenomenal global premiere of the Polestar 3 that we delivered in Copenhagen a few weeks ago in front of hundreds of media, shareholders, and customers. Polestar 3 is our first SUV, built for the electric age. It is full of fantastic features. Centralized computing with a NVIDIA Drive core computing, for example, running on software from Volvo Cars, making it one of the safest cars and prepared for the future of highway piloting. Polestar 3 is a car that has been designed as a Polestar from start to finish. It defines the essence of our brand in terms of design, luxury, and ambition. Other milestones were, of course, our successful listing on New York's NASDAQ in June. A new global partnership with Hertz, totaling 65,000 cars over the five years. We move fast here. Already today, you will find in seven countries in Europe and in the US and Canada, a Polestar fleet with Hertz. And we are continuing month after month to expand this offer of electric Polestars into the mobility on demand arena. Last week, we have announced a $1.6 billion financing package from our major shareholders. We welcome their strong and continued support, especially when capital markets are volatile and unpredictable. In the first nine months of 2022, we delivered approximately 30,400 vehicles globally, up around 100% year on year. Our fourth quarter is expected to be our strongest on record yet, and we are delivering against our 50,000 cars target. This is us meeting our annual targets for two years in a row, having also achieved our 2021 delivery target. We will celebrate next week a major production milestone, 100,000 Polestar 2 vehicles out of the factory gate. This solidifies our position as one of two global pure EV players already in mass production. Our cars have been recognized with multiple awards, and I'm particularly proud that the Car Design Awards recognized Polestar with the prestigious Best Brand Design Language for 2022. I would like to conclude with investment highlights that differentiate Polestar from others and will enable us to deliver on our strong strategy. One, a well-defined growth strategy, which are capturing by operating in fast growing car segments, having a rapidly expanding premium product portfolio that includes five pure EVs vehicles by 26, and with a global footprint of 27 active markets today. Unlike most of our peers, our global ambitions, they are reality, not an aspiration. Two, 
the asset life model. It combines the best of both worlds, agility of a startup with the stability and manufacturing know-how from Volvo Cars and Geely. Importantly, this gives us access to production capacities across Asia, Europe, and US without having to build our own factories or find manufacturing partners. Three, we have a digital first, direct to consumer approach that is complemented by an extensive network of retail sales and service points. Four, our core pillars of design, innovation, and sustainability, coupled with relentless focus and attention to detail. This includes avant-garde, pure Scandinavian design, performance-oriented hardware technology, innovative software solutions and smart partnerships, and the leading ambition to create a truly carbon-neutral car by 2030. Now lastly, demand for Polestar 2 remains very strong we would have easily exceeded our vehicle sales target were it not for Shanghai lockdown earlier this year. Initial reception and demand for Polestar 3 is also incredible. Over 800,000 of YouTube viewers watched the world premiere of Polestar 3 online. It has created website traffic for Polestar similar high to the bus that our extremely successful Super Bowl campaign produced earlier this year. I would like to reiterate, Polestar is a real car company. We are in production. We are putting cars on the road today. And we are delivering on our ambitious growth plan. Now, Johan, I would like to ask you to comment on our financial results. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, hello, everyone. And as Thomas said, thank you very much for joining our first quarterly earnings call. I look forward to interacting with many of you in the future, and please continue to engage with Bojana and the IR team, who are always here to support. We're glad that you are joining us on our exciting journey as a listed company, now and into the future. And moving on to the main part of my section, first some operational highlights. We have delivered 30,424 cars globally in the first nine months of this year of which 9,239 in the third quarter, alongside continued expansion in existing and new markets. As of today, we are active in 27 markets on four continents and have 128 locations and over 1,000 service points. We reaffirmed earlier this year, as well as today, that we are on track to deliver 50,000 vehicles by the end of 2022. We said we would catch up on production, and we did. Our strong partnership with Volvo Cars and Geely has allowed us to navigate through the supply chain constraints. The remaining 20,000 cars for 2022 have all been produced and are making their way or being delivered to customers across the globe. Q4 2022 is expected to be our strongest quarter on record yet. Now moving on to financial highlights for the nine months ended September 30th, 2022. As this is our first earnings call as a listed company, I will focus on nine months year-to-date commentary versus the same period last year and provide additional color for notable exceptions for the third quarter. Revenue increased 98% from $748 million in 2021 to $1.48 billion in 2022, mainly driven by an increase in Polestar 2 vehicle sales across existing and new markets. This growth was partially offset by slightly lower revenue per vehicle due to product and market mix. And to put this into context, during the first nine months of 2021, we mainly sold long-range dual-motor variants of the Polestar 2, while throughout this year, we are also selling lower-priced variants, which have an impact on revenue per vehicle. Gross profit increased from $1 million in 2021 to $57 million in 2022 leading to a gross margin increase from 0.1% to 3.9%. This was driven by higher Polestar 2 sales and lower fixed manufacturing costs. When we look at Q3 2022, gross margin was 0.9%. This is a reflection of two factors. Firstly, a negative market mix from proportionately higher sales outside of Europe, where revenue per car is typically lower. And secondly, from FX headwinds. As our cars are produced in China, 
the majority of our costs are in renminbi, which are strengthened against European country, uh, currencies, leading to a higher cost of sales. Selling general and administrative expenses was only 31% higher at 625 million compared to the 98% growth in revenues as we start to accrue benefits of scale. For the third quarter this year, SG&A expense was 20 million lower compared to the same period last year. This reduction was driven by management actions in curtailing advertising, marketing, and promotional activities in anticipation of the expected lower volumes in Q3. Research and development expenses were down 22% to 123 million due to lower amortization of intangible assets, partially offset by higher spend on future vehicles and battery electric technologies. Operating loss was 64% higher at 1.08 billion, impacted by a 372 million non-recurring, non-cash share-based listing charge in connection with the business combination that we reported in Q2 2022. Excluding this listing charge, operating loss increased 8% from 658 million in 2021 to 709 million in 2022. For the third quarter of this year, operating loss decreased 33% to 196 million, benefiting from higher revenues and active cost management actions. And lastly, net income for the third quarter was a positive 299 million due to the gain on the change of the fair value of the earnout liability and warrants of 561 million, which is primarily attributable to the change in the share price. Moving on to the balance sheet. At the end of September 2022, cash and cash equivalents stood at 988 million. Now, in regards to cash flow, cash used for operating activities year to date was 1.02 billion, driven by an increase in working capital as well as higher operating losses and interest expenses. Cash used for investing activities was 653 million mainly due to the cash settlements for the post dollar two, three, and four intellectual property investments. Cash provided by financing activities was 1.97 billion, driven by the net listing proceeds of 1.42 billion and short-term working capital facilities totaling 1.56 billion, partially offset by nearly a billion in principal repayments. As Thomas mentioned, we obtained a 1.6 billion shareholder financing and liquidity package from our two major shareholders, which demonstrates their commitment and confidence in our future. This financial and liquidity package comprises of an 800 million 18 month term loan from Volvo Cars, matched in terms of total amount by the direct and indirect financing and liquidity support from our other main shareholder, TSD Investment. And you can find more detail on slide 16 in our investor update presentation. With the current macroeconomic and capital markets environment as a backdrop, the support from our major shareholders allows us to focus on ramping up the business to deliver the cars to our customers for post our three starter production and first customer deliveries. This funding transaction also allows us time to unlock a broader range of longer term financing alternatives when conditions in the capital markets improve. Before I hand over to the operator, let me wrap up with the outlook for the rest of this year. As I said before, despite continued supply chain constraints, we are on track to deliver on our full year guidance of 50,000 cars. We expect to deliver approximately 2.4 billion in revenues driven by strong Q4 2022 sales. We expect gross margins in the fourth quarter to be broadly in line with Q3 2022 with similar pressures from product and market mix alongside foreign exchange. We do expect a greater impact from higher raw material costs to flow through, but to be partially mitigated by the vehicle price increases implemented earlier this year. In terms of accessible liquidity, with 988 cash balance at the end of September 2022, the 1.6 billion shareholder financing and liquidity package, alongside other potential financing solutions, 
we anticipate adequate funding through 2023. Thank you again for joining, and now over to the operator for the Q&A section. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone keypad and wait for a name to be announced. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. This will take a few moments. Now I'm going to take the first question, and it comes from the line of Winnie Dong from Deutsche Bank. Your line is open. Please ask your question. Hi, thank you so much in advance for taking my questions. Yeah, I was wondering if you can quantify sort of how much uh, mix and revenue uh, and FX was um, impacting revenue and gross margin in a quarter, um, and then what are the puts and takes for the for the Q4 margin as well there. Um, in regards to FX, I think what I can say there is that if we look at the, the FX exposure we have, it's, it's predominantly related to the fact that we have manufacturing in China uh, and uh, therefore the exposure to the renminbi. Um, if, just to provide some guidance on, on sensitivity, I think, which is the best way to answer your question, um, if we look at a a full year impact of a 10% change in the CNY versus SEC, that would equate to approximately $200 million on EBIT. Okay, got it. And then um, sort of similar headwind um, and regional mix expected for, for Q4 impacting uh, Q4 margin, that's putting it sort of in line with, um, with Q3. Is that the right way to think about it? Yes, that's correct. That's our expectation that the Q4 margins would be brought in line with, with Q3. Uh, similar pressures from the product and market mix alongside the foreign exchange. Okay, got it. Um, and then I was wondering if they can also then uh, provide a bit more color on the um, 800 million in capital from PSD. Um, how much of that is committed and then any specifics on like what form or shape the liquidity might come might come through at sure so <clears throat> just to provide some more color then on this 1.6 billion shareholder financing and liquidity package on the one hand there's the 800 million dollar term loan from volvo cars um, with an optionally optional equity conversion feature uh, in connection with the future equity raise by polestar this is then matched in terms of total dollar amounts by PSD, who will support via a combination of various financing arrangements. And that's ranging them from certain fund, funding certain assets, um, and that may include purchasing non-core assets or entering into a sale and leaseback arrangements. Also ensuring access to additional working capital facilities and that may include them providing collateral support either directly or indirectly. And all of this we, uh, we expect to materialize during the course of next year. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, and then how do we think about puts and takes for um, sort of 2023 um, in terms of uh, demand? Uh, what are you seeing sort of in the US, Europe, and China, um, how they're affecting the demand into 2023 deliveries. Do you anticipate additional sort of pricing actions? So we were not planning on providing any uh, 2023 outlook today. This is something that we will come back to uh, and provide some guidance on our next earnings call when we cover the Q4 in the full year. Okay, thank you so much for taking my questions. Welcome. Thank you. Now we're going to take our next question. Please stand by. And the next question comes from the line of Charles Coldicott from Redburn. Your line is open. Please ask your question. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, so my first one, on the comment um, about you having sufficient funds to last through 2023, 
Um, I think the guidance that you gave during the DSPAC process was that free cash flow would be close to neutral in 2024, but maybe that's changed. Um, could you tell us how much funding beyond this $1.6 billion you need to eventually become self-funding and what year that will be? Hi, Charlie. So I think <clears throat> given all the current market uncertainty, um, we're not uh, going to give guidance on a specific point in time. I think what we can say is that we do expect to break even within the context of us reaching our 290,000 volume plan. Okay, understood. Um, and then um, just coming back to the, the gross margin uh, in Q4 and maybe into next year, um, in the text of your document, you, you mentioned that price increases for batteries and other components that have already taken place in the market have not actually be, been experienced by you yet because of the contract terms you have with Volvo. So could you talk about when you expect the impact of higher battery costs and what will be the magnitude of that impact on the gross margin? Sure. So <clears throat> when we look at... Uh raw material, for example, we see that there was only a limited impact in Q3 from the increases in raw material costs. And then and this is due to the time lag between when it's reflected in our bill of materials to when it flows through our P&L. With that being said, we also only experienced a limited impact from the previously impacted, implemented price increases uh, this summer due to the price protection of the order book at the time. So we expect both of these to have a larger impact in Q4. Okay, thank you. And then um, Volvo launched the EX90 yesterday. Um, now on a like for like basis, I think if, if I spec the cars with the same content, the launch version of the Polestar 3 long range dual motor is about 22,000 euros cheaper, which is about 20% cheaper than the EX90. Obviously, partly that's it's a five-seater versus a seven-seater, but a lot of the hardware and the battery pack capacity are identical. Um, so how confident are you that the unit economics of the Polestar 3 are going to work on a much lower price point than the EX90? Well, I cannot confirm the 20,000 that you refer here. I think that um, I cannot confirm there. And the picture is, of course, broader than that. You have to look into U.S., China, and uh, Euro pricing. And then our, our pricing, of course, is compared here um, with the Volvo pricing that includes the LIDAR, where we have the pricing that you refer to um, with the pilot pack without the LiDAR. So that will be, of course, um, an additional price on what you compare now. So all in all, we see that the positioning of the process three price-wise is not at all, um, if you spec it rightfully um, at the same level, is, is not at all um, below the uh, AX90 pricing, so that I cannot confirm. We are definitely going here um, for a premium pricing with the poster three. Okay, understood. If I can speak one last one then, the US market, um, can you talk about the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act, which obviously means that you don't get the incentive on the Polestar 2 anymore? whether or not you can rectify that. I don't know whether you can shift it to Charleston and, and, and how we think about regards to the Polestar 3. Hmm. Yeah, it's a bit difficult to comment on that because there are still too many uncertainties um, and we have to see really the full picture um, in the next year. Our customers are already um, at the moment excluded from that because of um, combined household income um, that takes them obviously above that threshold. Um, so for that reason, this is for now not a major event for us. 
but um, again, it's a little bit uh, too early to really comment on uh, comment on that. That we have to see how it develops in the new year. Okay. Thanks, guys. Sure. Thank you. Now we're going to take our next question. Please stand by. And the next question comes from the line of Itai Michele from CT. Your line is open. Please ask your question. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, just a, a couple of follow-ups. First, maybe I'm, I'm going back to the Toll Star 3, Thomas, hoping you can maybe share to it a little bit around um, what you might be seeing on reservations, um, your know, broader demand, as well as um, you know, maybe what you're seeing by, by region. And as well as a configurator, you know, what portion of, of consumers might be choosing the performance pack for the Polestar 3? Hmm. Yeah, reception for Polestar 3 has been fantastic. I mean, the, um, the, the launch was, we, we are satisfied and happy with the, with, the, with the reception of it. You have to excuse me being here a bit, uh, turning this around. We have much more focus now for us to really um, concentrate now on, on start of production of this car, first customer deliveries. That is what we, uh, what we are concentrating on our focus because we actually don't, don't worry or don't, um, are not in doubt about the customer demand here. We really want to um, make sure now that customers don't have to wait too long for the car and that we are actually able to uh, deliver on that uh, demand. Um, and for that reason, uh, that, that's, that's our strong focus. Great. Th thank you. And then, Thomas, how about on, on the Polestar 4, maybe to give an, an update there on uh, – it looks like from the slides it's still slated to launch next year. Just curious when you think production – may start or if you can give us a little bit more um, color on when you may uh, re reveal that, that vehicle. Mm. Yeah, that will be indeed part of our um, 2023 program to um, launch the car at least um, in, in where, where it will, will go um, into market first. We have the situation that, of course, the development of Polestar 4 is on track, very well advanced. Um, a little bit of explanation here, obviously, being um, spread out with the R&D forces here, having here the um, poster for a complete different uh, team working on it secures that there's uh, a very strong focus from that side on this development, and it is um, therefore nicely on track and we indeed will be preparing to bring this car to market um, within 2023. Terrific. And then maybe just a, a last question, maybe, maybe for Johan. Uh, if you think about uh, cash flow in the fourth quarter, a, any color you could provide on, on, on just how to think about working capital and maybe, maybe CapEx as well? Yes, sure. Um, <clears throat> working capital in fourth quarter, I, I would expect – an increase in working capital in the fourth quarter, but not to the same extent that we've seen year to date. Um, and the fourth quarter working capital increase would then be driven primarily by an increase in accounts receivable following the higher sales in Q4, whereas, uh, whereas I would expect inventory and accounts payable balances to be uh, remain very similar to, to what they were in Q3. In regards to CapEx, um, there, I would expect CapEx to be proportionally higher in Q4, um, but I would not expect it to exceed a million dollars in total for the full year. I think any delta to the prior CapEx guidance is related to timing um, rather to, than a, a change in the investment spend. So that would rather spill over into the next year then. That, that's, that's all very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to take our next question. Please stand by. And the next question comes from the line of Alex Potter from Piper Sandler. Your line is open. Please ask your question. 
Great, thanks very much for taking the question. Um, so my, my first question is regard, uh, regarding, I guess, supply chain health, generally speaking, and then specifically also uh, regarding outbound vehicle shipments from China. I, I know that generalized ocean shipping rates, they seem to have been coming down by a lot recently, but specific to the auto industry, I've heard that there's still a lack of ships. It can be difficult to find uh, ships that are capable of exporting cars out of China. So um, given how important China is to your manufacturing footprint, i um, just interested in, in hearing anything that you're willing to share on that topic of ocean shipping rates. Um, and then also, like I mentioned more generally on just the status of the supply chain overall. Yeah, when it comes to the logistics, um, yeah, they are, of course, challenging. That um, is something that everybody is experiencing. Having said that, um, we have very, very experienced partners supporting us in that. Um, us now having, for example, the 20,000 cars that, are, that, that have been produced that we um, uh, still have to deliver till the 50,000 uh, target, which we are confident in doing. Why are we confident? Because indeed the, uh, the logistics could be arranged. And yes, going out from China is, um, is one of the problems that you have to tackle in that, but there are alternatives around which we know how to deal with and work with and what we are using. So um, generally, the supply chain issues, the COVID-19 stuff, there is a big experience by now over the two years that helps us to deal with that. Specifically, logistics is something that in the broader Volvo Geely frame, this is something which is a very, very established and experienced organization that has been using these channels for decades. and indeed uh, have ways and uh, means of how to cope with this. Okay, great. That's helpful. And anything regarding semiconductors that you that you would want to call out? Well, what to say about this? Um, <laughs> um, semiconductors, um, yeah, that's part, part of what I um, try to describe here, two years of um, what I call the new normal um, have made us, of course, um, deal with this on, on a weekly, on a monthly base. And this is, this is something that will it change in 2023? No, all the experience that we have collected now to, to deal with that, um, we will have to use again in 2023. Um, having said that, this catch up that we have performed now here in August, September, October, of course, we're exactly under those conditions. And we managed to, after the Shanghai lockdown, to ramp up our production, have um, higher production than ever for POSA to under exactly those circumstances. And that is exactly where we feel, of course, as well, that we, uh, that we go well prepared in 2023. Okay, great. Yeah, I can appreciate it. The challenging environment to, for you and for everyone else. So um, I feel for you on that front. Um, maybe the last question, uh, just regarding sales and marketing, um, you mentioned that it ticks down here sequentially. Do you think that, um, you know, I, I guess I'm interested in, in learning maybe why that's the case, or are you just trying to preserve capital? Do you think this is a good sales and marketing run rate or do you think it'll tick back up again now that you're going to be pushing harder on Polestar 3? Just any um, any commentary you could give on the outlook for sales and marketing spend would be would be helpful. Thanks. Sure. <clears throat> um, the Our action to curtail that here in Q3 was in part driven by just recognizing that we would have uh, the expected lower volumes. Of course, as we enter into Q4 and uh, next year, we will ramp that back up again in order to support those uh, those volumes. So I would view it more as uh, something that impacted Q3. With that being said, um, you know, in, in light of the, the current market backdrop and of course the macro environment that we have and is likely to persist, we are 
very stringent in our spend, uh, specifically as it relates to our operational costs, not, on, not only advertising and promotion. And there we are working across the, the company to identify and ex execute on, on cost efficient opportunities. And of course, you know, that has to be balanced then with the growth phase we're in. So we are very calculated in the areas we're looking to hold back spend on. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thank you. Dear participants, as a reminder, if you wish to ask a question over the phone, please press star 1-1 one one on your telephone keypad. Now we're going to take our next question. And the next question comes from the line of Eric Golrung from SEB. Your line is open. Please ask your question. Thank you. I had four questions. Three of them have been asked. So, so I'll take the last one. And it's it, so, sort of some help on your your flexibility and maneuverability to the extent we get a, a clearly weaker sort of demand and economy next year. I mean, you, you say now you're, you're funded through 23, and I, I assume that's based on your existing forecast, right? But let's say things don't, don't doesn't turn out as well as you expect. How much room is there for you to sort of cut down on CapEx, manage working capital a bit more efficiently on the OPEX side, marketing, etc.? I mean, what, how, how much room for for uh, weak demand is there and, and while you still be able to keep a uh, to stay funded through next year? Any out there? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, we, we recognize that the macro environment is uh, challenging and, and likely persists. So um, we're not necessarily waiting for times to get worse. We're already now taking actions to, uh, to make sure that we're very prudent in our spend. So managing our operational costs, it's absolutely a key priority and that we're already taking actions towards, like I said, identifying and executing on, on cost efficiency opportunities um and um uh, so that's definitely one avenue uh, another avenue that we already today are working actively with with and uh it's just around the whole revenue uh management uh and of course uh in regards to optimizing mix levels of sales support etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think if anything all those work streams would just uh, intensify, but again, we're not waiting for times to get worse. We're already acting on those now. And I think what this 1.6 billion secure, of course, is as well the investment into our product portfolio. So that is in that way secured and guaranteed that we will not have to compromise on that. Um, we can market demand, whatever, of course, like, we can work on um, marketing costs. Not having to produce these cars automatically will be, of course, a different uh, um, a different business plan for us. So I think the the main key here is we with this funding support, we definitely can secure that we are on track um, developing the company, our product portfolio, our business, so that the projections, the ideas of where we want to be in 2025 uh, uh, are not influenced. And I can just echo what, what Thomas said, and the whole point of this is to safeguard the core programs. And so with the, you know, the, new, the three product launches we have over the next three years, we're really focused on delivering on those milestones and those, for those products to then start generating the revenues and the margins. Very good, thank you. And then if you could just follow up with a to, to confirm what you said previously on the question of uh, the Polestar 4. What, what, did you say that we'll see both the reveal and the production start next year, or did you just confirm that it will be presented to us next year? <laughs> well, we will launch the car, and that is not... I'm, I'm not talking here that, that we just go and present you the design of the car. That will be the start um, uh, of the launch that includes, of course, as well, industrial um, milestones that we will hit along the line in 23. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to take our next question. Please stand by. 
And the next question comes from the line of Charles Caldicott from Redburn. Your line is open. Please ask your question. Oh, hey, sorry. I, I thought I'd just jump back in if, if there was time. Um, I want to ask on China as well. So um, I think, if I'm correct, you've only only sold about a 1,000 Polestar 2s in China this year. And I guess to an extent, you're prioritizing Europe because it sounds like it's higher margin for you. But is it demand in China is maybe a bit more muted than you would have liked? And, and if so, how do you solve that? Is it just that the domestic OEMs are very competitive when it comes to EVs in China? Well, obviously, the launch of the Poster 3, and that I definitely should underline here, of course, the Poster 4, will be very crucial products for us to get into a competitive and strong position here in China. And for that reason, um, we definitely expect and work on a market in China where with Poster 3 and 4, we will accelerate and make that as well an important part of our business. Okay, understood. And, and, and then just another one on the funding. The, the latest um, funding round is, is from Volvo and Geely again. Um, I wonder, um, you know, at what stage do you think that Volvo and Geely might be willing to perhaps relinquish some of their stake um, in order to increase the free, free float of Polestar? Yeah, Charlie, I mean, that's really a, a question for them rather than for us. Um, the uh, <clears throat> the lockup from the, the SPAC transaction expires here in, in, uh, in uh, December. And, uh, of course, that will release the shares not only from our two major shareholders, but from other – or from – non-related parties as well, uh, which then over time should help the free float. But in regards to a specific question for the share, I think that's more of a question for our shareholders. Fair enough. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Dear participants, as a reminder, if you wish to ask a question, please press star 1-1 one, one on your telephone keypad. There are no further questions at this time. I would now like to hand the conference over to our speaker, Thomas Ingenlove, for closing remarks. Okay, then, thank you all for joining um, on our first quarterly results call. Um, let me then finish with three points just to summarize where we see the highlights of today. Um, and that is definitely that Despite the challenges that are affecting our whole industry, we are very delighted that we are on track to reach the target of 50,000 deliveries this year. Um, secondly, we have launched the POSA 3. That's a major real milestone for our company, taking us into that premium SUV sector. And last but not least, the financing package secured from our shareholders. Um, allows Polestar to focus on delivering more cars to more customers. And as we talked about next year, you will not only see the first deliveries of the Polestar 3, but we will also launch the Polestar 4. I look forward to telling you more when we speak next time and hopefully see you as well, um, each other, along this exciting journey of Polestar in 2023. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.